Hello, and welcome to the AAMFT Podcast, your all-access pass to the latest news developments and thought leaders in the world of systemic therapy. We strive to relate, educate, and innovate, one episode at a time. I'm your host, Dr. Eli Karam, and we're brought to you by the American Association for Marriage and Family Therapy. Our podcast explores topics that relationship-based therapists care about. In addition to featuring unique conversations and interviews with established experts, our show provides information and education on direct practice and emerging trends in the MFT profession. For more information, please visit us at aamft.org. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Eli, back with you here for another installment of the AAMFT podcast. Love bringing you the show each and every time. And today, something that many therapists, professionally young and old, struggled with. How do I work with clients on their sexuality, especially female clients? And what if some of the same things my my clients are struggling with, I am too. So today, uh, a podcast that can work on multiple levels. How to help your clients kind of embrace their sexuality and be comfortable with it. Uh, But first, how can you do the work on yourself to be in a spot where you can be therapeutic and a help for clients doing that? We're going to talk to that today with my friend and colleague, Dr. Alexandra Solomon. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Alexandra. She is a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at Northwestern University. Uh, She spent the last two decades of her life uh, working with couples and individuals all around relational and sexual health. She is an affiliate at the Family Institute at Northwestern University. In addition to writing articles and chapters for leading journals and books in the field of marriage and the family, she's the author of the book, Loving Bravely. 20 Lessons of Self-Discovery to Help You Get the Love You Want, and what just came out in February of this year, her second book, all about what she calls sexual and relational self-awareness. It's called Taking Sexy Back, How to Own Your Own Sexuality and Create the Relationship You Want. We're going to learn a lot today about, again, how you get yourself comfortable, especially young therapists listening to this show. You say, I'm not in a relationship, much less married. Um, How can I talk to clients uh, about their sexuality when I myself have not figured some of this out? So as always, I hope this is a a podcast that you can both enjoy the conversation and get some tools that will help you in your practice of couple and family therapy. Okay, welcome to the show, Alexandra Solomon. Uh, We have known each other for a long time. It has been great to follow your career and you really have become an emerging leader in what we're going to talk about today, kind of uh, emerging female sexuality, and we're going to cover the gamut. So the way I always like to start, if you're a familiar listener to the podcast, is kind of the origin story of our guests. So in general, tell us how you got to become a couple therapist and specifically working with uh, women's sexuality, Alexandra. Right. It's so good to connect with you. I know you're right. Our roots go way back, don't they? Yeah. It's it's going to be about 20 years, (laughs) believe it or not. That's right. Um, Yeah, so I mean, my origin story, you know, as far as I arrived at Northwestern University to start my uh, doctoral studies, really clear that what I wanted to study were, you know, what what lived in my mind as sort of feminist issues or women's issues. So body image and interpersonal violence and these kinds of um, gender and power dynamics. What I, and I think that I had this, you know, I had this kind of idea in my head that to study marriage was somehow soft or not <laughs> particularly progressive. So I sort of never really considered the study of marriage. And then I had an opportunity to interview with Bill Pinzoff at the Family Institute for a research and clinical, uh, you know, internship, couple years of study with him. And it was like a lightning bolt. And I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> to look at the to look at the system of a marriage is to look at all of these things that I'm fascinated by gender and power and intimacy and how our culture shapes who we are and what we want and it was like these two things that I had thought had to be separate actually you know coexist in the same space did you have clinical aspirations at the beginning or did, did that come from a, a, a kind of a your combined experience there at Northwestern you know I think I, I went in really wanting to do clinical work I really liked the scientist practitioner model like you know I really liked this idea of of having a career that involved different elements teaching and writing and clinical work. And that's that has, um, I, I feel really fortunate that I've found ways to have all those pieces 
active because as you know, each one informs the other, right? I'm a better clinician because I'm a teacher. I'm a better teacher because I'm a clinician. I write from that place of being both in the classroom and in the therapy setting. There's also something about coming of age, uh, you know, starting professionally young in your early 20s in a graduate program and kind of doing the work as your own, you know, sexuality and own relationships emerge. It's kind of a, a parallel process. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Absolutely. Right. I mean, I I think that my, I'm in, um, my husband and I are in year 22 of our marriage. And so we were, right, a dating couple when I started graduate school and then an engaged couple and then a married couple. And so that relationship has involved, evolved, as you're saying, right, in parallel with my career. And I think that I've always taken my work home with me. And um, my husband's favorite joke, you know, like at a cocktail party when people are like, oh boy, what's it like to be married to a relationship expert? And my husband's joke is always, you know, a funny thing, the best batting coaches turns out had terrible hitting records themselves. <laughs> so <laughs> it's always his effort to keep me humble in this work, which certainly I try to be. And then the inspiration uh, for your book that's come out in 2020, Taking Sexy Back, which is, uh, I think, really going to appeal to a lot of people, both uh, consumers, but also uh, our target audience, which is systemic therapists that work uh, with couples and individuals around sexuality. So what's the inspiration for the current book? Boy, you know, I don't know that I... I mean, if you would have asked 25-year-old Alexandra, did you ever, can you imagine that you will write a book about sex? I think I would have, you know, laughed in your face. Um, I didn't see this coming, but it was really, it felt really necessary. You know, I, for as well as I was trained in our field, I didn't, I didn't learn about sexuality in the way that I wish I had. I, what I was told as a couples therapist is when you get the couple to argue less and communicate more effectively, the sex will follow. It was sort of like the communication was in the foreground and the erotic life was in the background. And um, and that in some ways reinforces the split, I think, that exists in our culture in general, which is that we quarantine off conversations about sex. And we sort of say that those people are the ones who talk about sex or wonder about sex or are curious about sex. And so I think the, you know, the main, main source of inf- inspiration, honestly, is the teaching that I do. So when I'm with graduate students and undergraduate students, I am just so aware of how paltry the American sex education system is and how how ill-prepared emerging adults are around um, around sex. I had a student say to me, this is the first, you know, I, I gave a lecture in, in my Marriage 101 class about sex. And he came up to me afterwards and he said, it's the first time I've ever heard a, you know, quote unquote, grown up talk about sex without talking about disease or without talking about sin or without talking about risk. In a pathological, pathological way. Yeah. And just like this idea that it's really dangerous and risky and just without giving us, without giving young people a sense of, right, not really normalizing, normalizing it, um, validating curiosity, and especially talking about pleasure, joy, creativity, and play. Yeah. So, you know, that, and I, I do think, I mean, all those, those things are important in the field. And one of the questions I, I want to ask you is how you've seen the field progress in the last two decades and how we talk about it, how we train therapists, but, you know, sex was this pathological thing and systemic thinkers as couple and family therapists were stra- uh, taught to look for strength and health, even in the most constraining of circumstance. So I think the frame um, that you obviously use, it's a parallel process that uh, you need to use it in training therapists that way. And, and, and if those therapists are going to talk to couples about it. So what, what have you seen the biggest changes as far as uh, in the field, as far as the profession uh, in couple therapy, how we talk about sexuality between now and, you know, 20 plus years ago when you entered the field? Yeah, I'm, I'm really curious your take on this as well. I, the biggest thing that stands out to me is that we really have, I think in a good way, we've blurred the line between the world out there and the world in here. You know, I think that we, I think our therapy offices are much more, I think we used to, I think this is a reflection of kind of white privilege in the field, you know, is that we used to see um, therapy as sort of existing separate and apart from politics or larger cultural conversations, perhaps, um, in a way that we've, I mean, that's, I think there were voices that were sort of saying, let's look at how power and privilege play out in the therapy realm. Certainly, you know, 20 years ago, Cheryl Rampage wrote the feminist family therapy book more than 20 years ago. So these conversations were starting, but they were maybe more, a bit more in the margins and they're a bit more mainstream now. And I think the cultural, like the bigger cultural context has changed. I think the Me Too movement is a big part of this. And I think with the Me Too movement, we're having new conversations about sexual 
drama that are really important, but it means that we also have to counterbalance that with like, okay, so if that's what's happening, what do we want instead? And how do we need to be talking about sex in ways that ensure that people are entering sexual experiences with a lot of empowerment, voice, ability to co-create, um, you know, a different frame where it's not just like power and transaction, it's about co-creation. But what what do you think? What do you, where do you go? No, when I'm, you think I'm right on. I feel like these um, kind of macro societal issues, so to speak, affect the, the micro practice of what we know as, as couple therapy. And I, I also think it's changed in the sense that you know, there are licensed uh, sex therapists, ASEX, a great association. But if, if uh, like in the state of which I live and practice Kentucky, there's uh, about 10 or 11 uh, ASEX therapists. So if you have to be a ASEX therapist to do work with couples around sexual issues, then there's not going to be that many providers. And I think a lot of times, couple therapists have to expand their frame and it goes to our, our training, how we train people with this idea that you can talk about sex or sexual enhancement in a non kind of pathological way is that you were saying and these outside forces, I think, give more voice to that. And I think people like you have given another voice that it's okay to talk about it, which is really what this book is about uh, for women. And you kind of talk about this distinction between inside out versus outside in sexuality for females, which I think is another one of those paradigm shifts. Uh, tell our listeners a little bit about what you mean by that and how you um, how you talk to clients. Yeah, this is, I mean, I, I really agree with what you're saying about there is certainly a beautiful place for um, sex therapists. And my gosh, I'm so glad that we as a field have them. But for a lot of reasons, including right, availability, um, it may not be possible for people to work with a sex therapist. And I want couples therapists to be, to be facile and to be able to integrate conversations about sex I and mean, even individual therapists, right? Because people who are coming in with dating concerns or relationship concerns, it doesn't take long to thread back a presenting problem to a constraint that has to do with the sexual self. And so if we're going to leave the sexual self outside of the therapy room, we're going to be missing a really rich landscape of, of potential healing. And so I think I think it's okay if clinicians sort of blush and fumble, you know, and um, along the way in these conversations. But I think the self of the therapist work around who am I as a sexual being? What's my sexual story? What are the things that I've inherited around sexuality? And um, that that work for us as clinicians is vitally important. Um, and so that's what, right, when I'm talking in the book about shifting from an outside in experience of one's sexual self to an inside out, what I'm talking about here is that we all have this like sexual inheritance. It's the internalization of all the messages we've been given from our family, from our religious institution, from our school, from media, from pornography. We've sort of internalized all these messages about, and they're very gendered oftentimes, right? Men should, men are, women should, women are. And so these are the things we've been told about sex and about who we should be based on the body bodies we inhabit. And that's our inheritance. And if we don't, if we're not aware of the kind of water that we're swimming in, um, we're kind of being reactive, you know, around our sexuality rather than really choosing, okay, what do I want? Like, what do I believe? And so that inside out sexuality is where we end up when we've done the work as in the book of sex of, of enhancing or growing or expanding our sexual self-awareness, understanding what those messages are, which ones we need to shed, and then what we want to claim in its place. And for a whole lot of us, it's like basically shedding shameful messages, you know, about how we should look, about how we should be, about what we should and shouldn't do, and claiming messages that are a bit more wholehearted, a bit more self-compassionate around the sexual self, a bit more curious, just kind of relating. What I would like us to do is relate to our sexual selves as this dynamic, unfolding um, part of who we are. Yeah, this is where you talk about relational self-awareness. So just... Um Describe that for us. And again, as we said, it's a parallel process. Probably if I am a, whether um, professionally young or old, a therapist, if I am not that self-aware about myself, it's going to be hard to get a client to a higher level of self-awareness around their sexuality or, or any part of their life. But tell, talk to us a little bit about relational self-awareness. Yeah. So relational self-awareness is, is where I started. Um, so my first book called Loving Bravely is basically introducing this, this kind of big idea or, you know, why ranging, all-encompassing idea of relational self-awareness, which is, and I and I wrote, I positioned, um, you know, Loving Bravely as a relationships health help book, but it's sort of written as an antidote to what people often 
receive, especially people who are dating and looking for love, which is this idea of you've got to have these strategies and these rules and you have to get somebody to like you. And it's very game based and it's very other focused. You know, the, I mean, our dating apps are a, a really concrete way that that kind of focusing on the other, like just finding the right person, you know, is sort of this mindset. If I just have to keep swiping till I find the right person. And even when couples come into therapy, I think couples often come in. I loved um, Michelle Obama writes about this in, in her book, Becoming. She writes about going to couples therapy with Barack and feeling very sure that the couple's therapy would be she and the therapist fixing Barack. <laughs> and so I think that's how all of our couples come in, right? Is this idea like this marriage will be fine if just my partner would be different. And that's a place- and We call that the so fix my for- partner couple my kind partner of presentation. Couple. That's right. right. Yeah. right. <laughs> that's right. I mean, I so get it. I can think of all kinds of ways that my husband could be improved upon. But if I want to be courageous, I'm going to look at what is that behavior in my husband activating in me what's it stirring in me why am I struggling with it what is how what is he mirroring back to me in this moment and so that's what relational self-awareness is about is really viewing relationships no matter if it's the first date or the 20th year reviewing the relationship as this like crucible in this classroom for self-reflection self-understanding self-expansion um and so it's so the loving bravely is this like journey into the self like who am I what's my relationship to relationships yeah and um in this book kind of expanding on that this idea of you have to be relationally self-aware about all parts of your relationship but it's specifically about the sexual part i think sometimes people they focus on you know what they like about themselves sexually but the stuff that they don't or they're uncomfortable with they they don't necessarily want to focus on so perhaps it's 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 harder to be relationally self-aware about your sexual self what are you what are your thoughts on that yes i think for sure mm-hmm. i i think what's complicated is that that, you know, sex is a behavior, certainly, right? It's a set of behaviors, touch-based, erotically charged behaviors, certainly. But sex is also like this portal into the deepest questions we have as human beings, right? Like, am I okay? Are you with me? Do you see me? Do I matter? Um, and I think that there's, there's in that way, there's like no such thing as meaningless sex, right? Even casual, even a casual sexual encounter, the me- there's meaning there because we are humans, we're going to make meaning. So the meaning may be, I, I deserve to play or I want to explore or I'm breaking through, you know, a, a taboo that I had. And so just sexual self-awareness is, is just a continuous willingness, a continued willingness to be curious about what my erotic self is trying to say to me, what it's yearning for and then what that says about me as a person what i'm wanting what i'm needing because we know especially when it comes to sex we know that whatever as you're saying like those parts we don't like or those parts we judge or those beliefs we have that we don't like whatever we kind of shut off and say i can't look at that the moment we shut it off it, we give it power right and it's going to come out some way i think that's oftentimes what happens with infidelity right there's something some aspect of the self that we've said i can't look at that that's dangerous that's risky that doesn't belong here we've split it off put it over there in the corner and it's just going to get supercharged over there in the corner and it, that's what how we create the conditions for acting out versus relating to what's happening inside of us curiously and like as a data point and being like, okay, so what is that? What does that desire say about me? What do I want to do about that? What can I learn from it? Having a bit more curiosity and tolerance for our, our complex <laughs> natures. And, you know, and certainly work with clients like this that really they get anxious about the sexual relationship or their partner's response to them because they get a lot of their um, reflected sense of self through how their partner views them sexually uh, versus kind of owning it kind of internally, which is also when you talk about kind of inside out sexuality, I think you're talking about uh, specifically in your book for females, rather than getting that reflected from their partners, them being really committed to knowing what they want and being comfortable and curious about that and really owning it in a different way. Right. I mean, my gosh, don't you think that so many of our questions that we sit with our clients with and ourselves with come down to this, like, is it, you know, it's sort of the, um, do I need to soothe myself and stand in my own truth or do I need my partner to validate me? And I end up sort of being like, yes, we need both of those things. But there was a question, um, you know, I do a lot on social media and somebody, there was a question that had come in around a woman who is partnered with a man who really enjoys 
uh, oral sex and what the research, the, another change in our field in the last 20 years is the re- we have research now on female sexuality that we just didn't have 20 years ago. And the research is, you know, pretty clear. There's a significant orgasm gap um, that's, that stands out most significantly when a man and a woman go to bed together. The orgasm gap is sort of most profound in those situations with her orgasming less, you know, less likely to orgasm than him. And it makes sense when we look at the heterosexual script, which has sort of held up um, penetrative sex as, you know, the most sex one can have, right? We sort of held that up as, you know, that's how we have defined virginity, right? Which is sort of the strange social construct that centers, you know, this identity variable on whether or not somebody's had this one you know, experience with this one particular sex act. But, um, you know, what we know, what research has shown us is that a woman is is less likely to have an orgasm um, from penetrative sex than she is, for example, from oral sex or from something that's more manual or combination of things. And, um, and so if, if a man and woman go to bed together, and they're both kind of bound by this heterosexual script, and they're sort of you know, the, the script is, is taking them in this very linear way to that act, it's it's a good chance that she won't have an orgasm. And um, so anyways, this question to come in about a woman who was really wanting more oral sex in her relationship and her husband was willing to do it, but he wasn't like craving it. And she felt she felt guilty that he wasn't loving it. And he felt, uh, you know, obligated. And what should she do? And um, of course, this is like a complicated question that deserves, you know, a tender unfolding conversation. But one of the things I wanted to highlight is it makes sense, right? That we both have been sort of both men and women have been sold this bill of goods around what sex counts as valid and good. And so he may have some stories that live in his head around what it means to um, do that to a woman and stories he's internalized about women's bodies. We've been really contemptuous about women's genitals, especially. Think about what some of the nastiest names are you can call a man. They tend to be names that are women's body parts, right? So... Um, there's a lot to unpack there around women's sexuality, but that unpacking is something that w- women and men need to be doing together and looking at how these scripts have really limited our possibilities for intimacy, connection, exploration. Yeah, I mean, you're you're good um, telling us, you know, you're, you've done so much clinical work and you are, yes, a wealth of information as far as things on social media, but tell us some actually clinical stories of your work uh, with either individuals or couples that have inspired your thinking around what you've put in the book? Oh, yeah. Well, one, you know, one aha moment that comes to mind was um, something that happened. I was sitting with some, working with some graduate students. And one of the graduate students had a question and her question started, she said, you know, um, you know the sex that you have to have while you're dating, like the sex you have to have like early on before you really know somebody and then the sex gets good. And then she wanted to kind of like ask her question from there. And what I did was I was like, but let's let's pause there and let's unpack that because what she was presenting, right, was this paradigm that like in the dating world, like what has to happen is that women especially have to tolerate sex that doesn't center on what they want in order to get to a point in the relationship arc, the narrative arc, where they can ask for the sex that they really want. And I just wanted wanted to invite all of us to be mindful about that premise, right? And she's an emerging, she was an emerging clinician and I wanted her to really question that, that story that lived inside of her, right? Because then if she goes to sit with clients, you know, if that's her story that you kind of have to suck it up and have some lousy sex before you can have good sex, then she'll be normalizing that with her clients. And we end up with this sort of like race to the bottom where where people really aren't asking for what they want and need. And so that was, that was a, that's not a clinical, it's an indirectly clinical example, right? No, but it's getting to my next point in that both of us share passion of of training the next generation of of couple and family therapist. And a lot of times, you know, when I'm teaching my couples course and, and are doing supervision, the, the thing that young clinicians are the most anxious about is talking to couples about their sex life or how am I going to talk about to somebody else about their sex life if I don't really feel confident in mine so the story you just uh, mentioned made me think of you know how should we train therapists better uh, systemic therapists to work with sexual issues specifically female sexual issues in the sense that um, 
I think it's very important. Some people are lucky enough to have a whole course or series of courses around sexuality or couples therapy, but many people don't. They've just started doing this work and they are really anxious about initiating that dialogue with the client because I think it's refreshing when a client comes in where that is the presenting problem. But as you were saying earlier, it's usually the golden thread that runs through everything. If they're having a problem with communication in their relationship, it probably ties back to sex. But let's talk about your advice for young clinicians, many of which that's our audience to listen to this podcast. How do you become comfortable having this kind of sexual dialogue with your clients? Right, right, right. Yeah, as you're saying, the, either the golden thread that the, that the problem goes back to a sexual problem, or at least that if and as the couple really is able to enjoy and relish erotic connection, it at least buffers them from the grind of the problem, right? So like then, so sometimes the sexual work just it just helps us have a bit of like money in the bank, you know, like it becomes an asset then or a cushion to the, the challenges of marriage, of connection, of domesticity, you know? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that there's part of it is probably us as faculty and supervisors modeling it, right? So our own willingness to read these books, listen to sexuality-based podcasts, um, look at our, the, own, the ways that we have sort of marginalized conversations about sex. I know that I, I mean, I know that I have had a long fascination about sex, but I always felt like I, I couldn't. Like, I'm a couples therapist. I'm, an, I'm in the marriage and family therapy world. And so, therefore, I'm if I'm this, then I'm not that. And the, that was a sex therapist. If I'm a couples therapist, then I'm not a sex therapist. And somehow, those books, those seminars, those conferences, those um, resources were not somehow mine. So that's that would be the first thing. It's just like wondering within yourself, what are the ways in which you have said to yourself, like, if I'm this, then I can't be that, you know? And so I think we as faculty and supervisors um, or, or anything, if it's whether it's like sort of I'm an older man, therefore I can't be curious about emerging adult sexuality or I'm a whatever the ways and I'm a, I'm a person of color. I'm a this, I'm a that. Like I'm, I'm a um, sexual minority. I'm a that. Like ways in which we we have been told, like we've been we've been given all these messages about you are this and therefore you can't be that. Being really thoughtful about what are the ways that you have internalized that mass message and and how might you want to push back around that? Like I, I mean, my gosh, <laughs> I think writing <laughs> writing books in general is a massive invitation to expanding one's own understanding. I bumped against bumped up against that a million times in my process of writing the book. Like I can't say that I'm married. I can't say that I'm in my forties. I can't say that I'm you know, not X enough to be able to, I just, it's just, so that's part of it. It's just like, what can we who are in those positions to be leading these conversations, what's the work we need to do in order to be more self-compassionate and just say, I don't, there are no easy answers here, but I'm willing to sit in the muck with you as emerging clinicians. Like, let's sit in this muck and work on it together. Well, yeah, what, uh, following on that, what do you think of the kind of personal qualities, um, people that, uh, clinicians that do the best as far as working with with clients um, that are exploring their sexuality what do, what do you what are the things you have to have to be comfortable doing this work I think one I think a big one is an ability to tolerate complexity um, and the ability to not have easy answers you know sex conversations about sex like the they refuse um conversations about sex have to be have to be had in a space that is just curious meandering and and refuses to have an easy answer right because the nature i think the nature of the erotic is that it's kind of unruly and it doesn't want to be it doesn't want to be told what to do so a, cl a clinician who wants to be like you should do this the moment the clinician says okay client do this not that the clients you know erotic is going to be like uh <laughs> Heck no. You know, like the nature of the erotic is that it's unruly and doesn't want to be held in. So I think a clinician needs to be willing to just kind of sit in some complexity and and not be like top down. For sure. And I think a lot of times what we're talking about today is like 
uh, what you were saying earlier about graduate student you were supervising is there's just a lot of kind of misinformation. Uh, so I think a good clinician working uh, is curious themselves uh, and also provides a lot of good psychoeducation that normalizes, like what you were talking about earlier, oral sex versus penetrative sex and have the orgasm. I still think there's a lot of even our clients that look very high functioning that they're, they're just missing some basic information, which is also why reading a book like yours in, in the kind of comfort of your own home is also very normal. So I think that those are qualities that we have to have. You know, our, at the master's level, uh, certainly uh, frontline clinicians is a female heavy profession, but we also have some male listeners out there. And, you know, one of the questions I got leading into this interview is if you're a male clinician working uh, with a female around sexual issues, um, how how is that similar or different, do you think, uh, female working with another female? Yes. Oh, my gosh. I, that's a wonderful question. I think there's so much space for men in this work. And I think that um, it was why. So when we wrote, when I wrote Teen Sexy Back, I we included a chapter towards the end of the book that's called uh, Open Letter um, to Men Who Love Women Who Are Taking Sexy Back. And so love, I'm using that in a really big way big way. It may be a male ally. It may be a lover or a partner. It may be a male therapist who is supporting a a woman who's going through her own kind of journey of becoming more sexually self-aware. And I I think because, you know, because as a systemic thinker, we know that change in one part of a system will shake the entire system. I wanted to make sure that men felt really supported. And I think what can happen is that men can feel there can be this spike of defensiveness, right? Because there can be a spike of defensiveness or a fear of not knowing or a fear of saying something wrong or, a, um, and so I think the most important thing is just for men to be, male clinicians to be willing to hold space, right? Just that idea of holding space and bearing witness to a woman's conversation and not feeling like they have to provide the answers, but just providing that like really important witnessing and validation. I think there's there's wonderful potential there um, for women to have a different experience of men in general by sitting with a male clinician who is deeply, deeply invested in um, offering support and being willing to listen curiously and not um, in providing, as you're saying, providing information or saying, let's look at some resources together um, that they don't have to have all the answers but they have to say like okay I'm in this with you and let's figure out how to get you the information that you need yes uh, you know you mentioned our, our shared mentor at uh, the late of the family institute uh, dr. Bill Pinsoff uh, mm-hmm. other people that have inspired you that you think if you're listening to this podcast are really important voices in the way uh, emerging couple therapist and even individual therapists working with uh, sexuality who, who has influenced you and who do you you think uh, is an important voice to listen to in the field today? Oh, yeah. Wonderful. That's, I mean, it's such an exciting time to be in this field, isn't it? I feel like uh, I feel like couples therapy especially is becoming very cool. <laughs> you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of interest in really good, high-quality relationship content, like your podcast being one of them, right? Like how amazing that you can create these conversations that just become free and accessible, you know, um, to a broad audience. I think it's so wonderful. But um, I, I mean, of course, Esther Perel is um, a dear friend of mine and a really, really, really important voice in this work. I love Emily Nagoski's book, Come As You Are. That book is incredibly inspiring, normalizing, and important. She does a great job of bridging science and mindfulness. Um, Dr. Lori Brado, who wrote the foreword to Taking Sexy Back, um, has a beautiful book called Better Sex Through Mindfulness. She's a clinician in um, Vancouver um, who's got some great research that she translated into a self-help book. I love her work. Um, and oh, um, Dr. Mona Fishbane has been a long, long time mentor and friend of mine. She wrote the foreword to Loving Bravely. I think that she's been a really um, just a, a, a dear, important mentor to me around um, just around always just around systemic thinking as as Bill Pinsoff, of course. Um, and that's that's the most important thing, isn't it? Just helping people look through a systemic lens. There's no such every every single sexual problem is a couple problem. And that's whether it's a you know casual sexual encounter or an early sexual relationship, whatever problem 
I'm having is a we, there's no I in it. It's a we thing. And so it needs to, that's the most important thing I think that as therapists we can do is help our clients because I think sexual problems especially feel so much like I'm doing it wrong. Something's wrong with me. And there's always a way to frame it as what, how can we as a couple work together given your concern or given your constraint or given your problem. There's always a we lens we can move into. Yeah, I bring that up because I think especially around sexual issues, people are squeamish maybe if they've never been to therapy, but but certainly around that. So sometimes a good book, as I was saying earlier, it normalizes some of these things like, like your writing and then that provides a voice or dialogue that lets people follow up uh, then with the therapist or gives a way to dialogue with a partner. So I think more than anything else, and in fact, when, when people come in to see me, they have usually, uh, especially around a sexual issue, they've usually done a lot of reading or homework before that. And a lot of times it is giving them the courage come in and and do the work with a, a couple or a, a family therapist. Yeah, I to- I totally resonate with that. The thing I hadn't anticipated when I wrote Loving Bravely is that is the number of people who would come to me and say, my therapist and I have been working our way together through Loving Bravely. And every week we do another lesson of the book together. I hadn't anticipated that, you know, that that's that having or, or my partner and I are reading this book together. I think having that neutral third thing is really helpful, whether that thing is you know, I think and having that thing be a, a book is is very helpful to just, as you're saying, start the conversation, normalize the conversation, because that's oftentimes the hardest part. And I think that's what we're seeing as well with Taking Sexy Back, because it's another, I mean, it's no surprise as a professor, I write my books like, a, like curricula. So it becomes this way where you can move lesson by lesson, chapter by chapter through this content and kind of have it be an opening to new insights about who you are, who you and who you want to be. And even even the current book, um, Taking Sexy Back, which is written for a female audience, if you're a male reading that, you can learn a lot. I mean, that can open up a lot of conversations with your partner. So it is very much designed uh, to do that. You know, another interest that you have, which I think is very interesting, too, you know, we're talking about people. What if you're, okay, you're paired up, you're in a committed, cohabitating relationship, and you're trying to grow sexually or get out of a rut. But then what about individuals that aren't in a relationship? This is important to them, becoming more comfortable, and they're dating. I know you have designed a lot of uh, really thought-provoking and informative stuff for singles too. Please talk about that. Yes, that's that I think is one of the main messages that I want to get across with this book is that your your sexuality belongs to you and it is yours it is independent of relationship status. And so I think that when somebody is a single, dating, exploring, it's a beautiful time to really connect more deeply with one's erotic self. And and that may happen, um, that can happen totally not with a partner, right? So what are the, what, oh, it's basically like, how might one do when one's single, how might one do couples therapy between the person and their erotic self. Like that's a beautiful time to be exploring um, touch. I think especially for women who have been, um, I think the whole topic of masturbation and self-touch um, is has been really, really taboo. But I think especially for women where there's often time, you know, the research shows that only about half of college age women can accurately identify the parts of the female external genitalia. And that which can't be named can't really be understood. And so there may be the important healing and reclamation that comes from a woman engaging with her erotic self separate and apart from a partner. And the more she knows and understands her own pleasure, and the more she feels at ease and comfortable in her own skin, then she can show up in a, sep- in a sexual space. She knows when she's ready to be sexual. And when she is sexual, she knows how to ask unapologetically and un- without shame, she can ask for what she needs. She can um, really create an experience that then just amplifies what she already feels within herself, right? She comes into a sexual experience from a place of wholeness that she already has access to her her erotic self, but now with a partner, it's enhanced. It also makes it less scary to lose a partner, right? In a breakup, your partner doesn't take your sexuality with them. 
you are still sexual whether you're with or without a partner and so what are the ways that somebody there are lots of ways somebody can continue to access and honor their erotic self whether they're with a partner not just through masturbation but sometimes it's through um through dance or through some you know physical activity or through art or through um you know just honoring like skin what feels good on my skin like those five senses are all pathways into connection with this erotic self that we all have uh, and i love the way you said and also kind of again normalize you don't have to wait till you're in a committed relationship or it doesn't privilege just couples as far as from a female perspective to working on your sexuality that you can do it even if you're when you're single or dating and probably it's it's proactive to do that so that you can be as comfortable with yourself as you can when you are in a relationship and it's probably correlated with deepening a relationship uh, as far as uh, working on your as we've talked about earlier this how your relational self-awareness I got I got one more question for you before you can remind us again of, of the book and, and all the other great ways to connect with you so you are when we met, uh, you know, you didn't have children. Now you have teenagers and I have, I have preteens. So you, you are very comfortable with your sexuality and that's come through and makes you a good clinician and a good speaker and pr- uh, certainly a, probably a good mother too. How do you, what do your kids think about your work? And then how do you, as you increase your own relational self-awareness, um, how does this help? Not just in the, the couple relationship, but for our listeners out there, how does it help you be a better parent? And like this transgenerational, this beautiful thing, right, about what we think about family systems, that if, if you do this work that you're putting forth in the book, you have a chance to really, I think, change a dialogue about how you educate, how parents educate children uh, or teenagers around sexuality. It's this really beautiful thing. It's just kind of changing the culture uh, slowly, this um, major kind of transgenerational impact what, what are your thoughts on both you personally uh how, how what your kids think about your career and then how how um a couple therapists doing this work uh, impacts their parenting oh my gosh this is an entire another episode because yeah. i love talking about intergenerational i call them intergenerational love dialogues like when the generate when we span generations and this is what i've done like the classes i teach i always have my students do a, um, a love template interview right where they're talking to people who are you know within their family tree a generation or two above to talk not just about sex but about love and connection and intimacy and emotion i think that's so rich and I love that whenever I'm talking with parents or working with parents around these conversations, I always want conversations about sex to be embedded in conversations about relationship, right? So it's all kind of one and the same. It's all like different twists of the kaleidoscope that conversations about sex need to really be nestled within those larger conversations about connection, about intimacy. So um, yeah, and I, I think in my family in some ways it's no different than any other family. I get lots of eye rolls and lots of like, mom, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and that's um, I learned from Cheryl Rampage, another dear mentor of, of yours and mine. She would talk about when she was raising her kids that she would do these like 60 second truth bombs. And they would oftentimes happen in the car in the dark. And she would say, OK, I'm just going to tell you some stuff about topic X. And the kid would go, oh, no. OK, mom, go ahead. So that's that's how we do it in our home. I will say there's something I want to tell you about. And there's no pressure to you know hear anything back. Um, but it just kind of make make a variety of offerings and um and leave them there and then I try to I try to listen more than talk and I try to just like again as I'm saying like nest these conversations in larger conversations just about about life and who you are and who you want to be but I'll tell you what my daughter will not open a package from Amazon because she's <laughs> she was, <laughs> it was too many too many books about sex that were arriving while I was doing research for this book and so she gave up on <laughs> that what used to be a fun project became no longer fun when she's like right. mom it's another book about sex <laughs> all right one, one of things about if, if the listeners you can't tell from our, our talk um, on this episode is that you're again very accessible genuine and warm if people want to get a hold of you um, obviously um, the book is out now but how can people get a hold of you continue the dialogue where can they find you on social media you've also done a, a great TED talk uh, I mean you're, you're easy to find tell tell people what you have out currently and the best way to get a hold of you Sure. The easiest way is through my website. So that's just dralexandrasolomon.com. And all the information is really there. Um, I have a new a new CE course that we've d- I developed with uh, Psychotherapy Networker and uh, and PESI. And it's a it's a big course um, about all about 
um, helping clients who are single dating and single again. It's called Loving Bravely, helping clients who are single dating and single again. I'm excited about that. Um, the website's got lots of information. And then social media, the, the, I'm mostly on Instagram and Facebook. And so those those links are on the website, but it's just Dr. Instagram is dr.alexandra.solomon and I create a lot of content for Instagram and Facebook and have fun doing it. It's been really interesting to kind of grow in these new ways of um, accessing wider audiences that really didn't exist, certainly when you and I were training. Well, thank you so much for the conversation. Like you said, we could uh, have a whole nother uh, dialogue about uh, the outgrowths of what we've talked about today and maybe we will do that in the future. But uh, again, thank you so much uh, for what you're doing uh, for the field and for for sharing some time with us today. Thank you, Eli. It was so great to connect with you. There you have it. Another great conversation on the AAMFT podcast with Dr. Alexandra Solomon. And I really like these episodes that work on two levels, both things that make you think about yourself as an evolving systemic therapist, in this case, working around sexuality. And then usually the more thought and work you put into yourself, the better therapist you're going to make. You can find out all you want about Alexandra at Alexandra, DrAlexandraSolomon.com, S-O-L-O-M-O-N. And the book, again, from New Harbinger is called Taking Sexy Back. And her first book, which is also a great read that she referenced, is called Loving Bravely. We love to hear from you here on the podcast. The best way to get a hold of me is send me an email, info at EliCaram.com. That's I-N-F-O at EliCaram.com. E-L-I-K-A-R-A-M dot com. You can also send AMFT a line at communications at AMFT dot org. Follow the conversation on Twitter. The hashtag is always stay systemic. You can follow the AMFT at the AAMFT and I'm at Dr. Eli Live. Many great installments coming up for you in the next weeks and months on the podcast. We're going to start delving into the new topical interest networks that AMFT has formed, including couple and intimate relationships and MFTs in schools, MFTs in healthcare, among others. We'll also have uh, great model developers on the program, uh, including people like Don Balcom and Norm Epstein of Cognitive Behavioral Couple Therapy. We'll talk to Andy Christensen of Integrative Behavioral Couples Therapy and have some great luminaries in the field, including Chloe Madonis, Bill O'Hanlon, among others. Great things installed in store for you. As always, stay systemic.